Dr. Priya, the TMJ dog on TikTok, on YouTube, and on Instagram. Can you give us a little bit of a background, like how you trained, what you're trained in, what you do for people? Well, first off, thanks for having me. I'm a general dentist. I've been practicing since 2007. I sort of transitioned into taking care of patients with TMJ problems in 2018 when I met my mentor, Dr. Arthur L. Parker. Every patient was saying how he changed their lives, how he got them out of pain. And so he was the TMJ guy in the Portland, Oregon area. So I met him sort of on a whim. We met very organically. I started shadowing him and I was just so interested in what he did because every patient was saying how he improved the quality of their lives. And I just thought, what is he doing that we didn't learn in dental school? And I went to a great dental school. TMJ just, it, it's not covered that much for whatever reason it may be. And so I began shadowing him and then it turned into an apprenticeship almost. And then I bought the practice the last year when he retired. It's, it's turned into my life's work and my passion and I love it. I am limited to taking care of patients with TMJ disorders. And that's what I do day in and day out. And I just, I really, really love it. And so my training was mostly hands-on training with my mentor, who's been doing this work for over 40 years. He was around before Google was around. And so he had to figure this all out on his own. Like I had him and I had Google. And so I, and I, you know, I was very fortunate. TMJD can be incredibly difficult to diagnose, to treat effectively, to have long lasting results. And so he actually traveled the world and he worked with renowned osteopaths, renowned TMJ physical therapists, orthodontists. Of course, he had his own dental training. So he sort of combined all of that and came up with a very unique treatment modality and protocol that we use here that works really well for our patients. And so we have a pretty good success rate, uh, I would say about 90% in treating patients who have headaches, jaw pain, clicking or popping noises in their joints, episodes of the jaw locking, or they may even be locked when they come to see us. And so those can be incredibly difficult to diagnose first off and then to treat effectively. And so he really came up with such a great protocol that we're able to, you know, get our patients healthy again and functional. And it's, it's very, very gratifying work. I love what I do. So that's just a little bit about me. That's amazing. So you found this mentor and like, it was like, whoa, here's my life's work. Here's my purpose. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Why do you make YouTube and TikTok? Like what's brought you to social media? Yeah. So it all started actually with my YouTube channel and that was in 2020. And so, you know, that was a year of a lot of uncertainty for a lot of us. I mean, obviously COVID was raging and it was just, there was a lot going on. I mean, Portland itself too, with the um, protesting that was happening right after George Floyd was murdered, there was just a lot going on specifically here. I mean, in the world, of course, but also like Portland was sort of there was a lot going on. And so uh, once we opened up again after quarantine, we were trying to figure out a way to stay solvent, to be totally honest and realistic, because, uh, you know, I had planned to buy the practice and things were sort of moving along and then COVID happened. And, you know, we all sort of stopped and Dr. Parker said, let's all come up with ideas of how we can stay solvent and keep our heads above the water and keep this practice going because none of us want to lock the door and walk away because there are patients people that need us. And so his idea was he wrote a really informative booklet on um, information about TMJD, sort of some, some home remedies, et cetera. Um, other people in our practice had ideas of like Facebook marketing, Facebook ads, et cetera. And I just was sitting there twiddling my thumbs and I thought, well, what can I do? And I said, well, you know, there's not a lot of general information out there. Like if you Google TMJ disorders, I mean, there's some really technical stuff that comes up, but there's nothing in like, there wasn't anything that I was finding could like consistently being produced with um, information in layman's terms that's easy to understand, but also like accurate. And so I thought, let me start a YouTube channel. And I knew I was playing the long game. I knew that wasn't going to bring patients to us right away, but I just thought, you know, that's fine, but at least there's information and information is valuable. So it's sort of my way of, putting a little light and love out into the world <laughs> during the year of 2020 when we all probably wow. Yeah. That's that's awesome. That was around the time that I had gotten my face yoga training and I was starting to learn more about all of this. And I remember during my face yoga training, my instructor, she said, do you know what TMJD is? 
And they were like, no. And I, I had heard of it, but she, she, you know, she asked them and they were like, no. And she's like, well, you need to learn about it because at least half of your clients have it. Right. <laughs> so you need to right. know about it. And then I just quickly wrote down like TMJT, like yeah. look up as much as possible about this, you know, uh, pretty quickly. Once I started meeting with some clients, interacting with people online. Yeah. Like I, they were asking me questions. What do I do about this? What do I do about that? There's just so little out there. So looking at your content now, like I, I rewatched some of your videos the last few days and like they're so helpful so Thank good <laughs> yeah they're really really comprehensive and um yeah they're super super good thank you i'm glad you're making the content and i hope you continue i think it's amazing i think and anyone listening to this who's interested in learning more about tmjd definitely look up your youtube what, what's your youtube name? Uh, you can just look up my name so it's priya mystery or you could look up the tmj doc and it'll it'll pop right up let's get into a little bit more about tmjd what is tmjd sure sure so i mean it stands for temporomandibular joint disorder and the temporomandibular joint is just our jaw joint so the way we kind of talk about it at my office is we talk a lot about like problems within the joint itself and then problems with the muscles that surround and support the joint and the jaw so problems within the joint typically manifest as clicking or popping crackling noises so any of those noises or episodes of the jaw actually kind of catching or locking and when that happens, it's scary. I mean, it's panic inducing if you feel like you can't move your mouth or if it's stuck shut or open. Um, either can happen and neither is comfortable or fun to go through. But that sort of explains things happening inside the joint. So that kind of falls under the category of like we call it more TMJ disorder. Mm -hmm. Whereas the muscles that surround and support the jaw, that falls more under the category of TMD, which is temporal mandibular disorder or dysfunction. Mm -hmm. And TMD recognizes that there's actually a group of muscles that work together to guide and support the jaw. And if or when those muscles become dysfunctional, it can lead to a lot of issues. And so when I say they become dysfunctional, I mean, they get sort of trapped in this chronic pain and spasm cycle. And the way they get to that point is usually with chronic clenching, mm -hmm. chronic grinding, sometimes even the way the teeth fit together. So like there's specific bite patterns that lend themselves to these problems or history of injury to the head, neck, or jaw. Many of my patients have had multiple car accidents or whiplashes. So injuries to the neck can feed up and affect the muscles and the joints. So TMD, well, you know, once those muscles get kind of trapped in that pain and spasm cycle, it can be a tall order to get them functional and healthy again. And once they're in that state, it leads to a lot of different symptoms. So it can lead to headaches. That's like the number one thing that we see with this closely followed by ear related concerns. Hmm. So ear pain, stuffy ears, vertigo, ear ringing, and even hearing loss. And then it can, um, of course, go on to jaw pain, neck pain, shoulder pain, and even like numbness or tingling in the fingertips or the face. So with, with all those things I just listed, sometimes people only have one, like they just have the stuffy ears or they just have really bad headaches or so, so it can be really hard to figure out where that's coming from because typically um, somebody with a lot of headaches will go see their primary care, we'll send them to a neurologist who, and sometimes they um, end up treating it with Botox or really strong pain medications, which isn't necessarily wrong, but if there's a more conservative fix that doesn't involve medications, people are very interested in that as well. Mm. Or um, sometimes people just, not just, they have pretty bad ear pain. So they end up going to their ENT first, which makes sense. You want to get your ears checked out, but the ENT says your ears are fine. Mm. So then what? Right. And so um, TMD, because the symptoms are so vast and varied and they can come in really any combination along with problems inside the joint, like clicking, popping or episodes of the jaw locking, it can be really hard to diagnose. And, and TMD is often called the great imposter disease because it, it's tricky. Uh, and, and, and many dentists as dentists in dental school, most of us are not taught to recognize this. We're not taught to like, if a patient comes to us and just happens to mention at their cleaning appointment, their dental cleaning, hey, I have ear pain. We're not like, oh, I got you. I know what to do. We're not, we're not necessarily, that's not part of our training. And so for many of us. And so, um, so that's sort of a brief overview of, of the symptoms I commonly see with this. So at what stage do people typically come to you? Like, have they gotten to the point where it's already like quite dysfunctional? So typically, um, 
they've gotten to a point where it's pretty dysfunctional. And so many people say, you know, I had clicking and popping in my joint for years. It never bothered me. And then I woke up last week and my jaw was locked and I cannot get it open more than one or two finger widths. I'm in a ton of pain. The clicking and popping is gone now, but now I have this new issue. Mm -hmm. And if I could have gotten to them when it was clicking and popping, you know, it would have been a little bit easier to treat or, um, People have gone to sometimes all of these issues, especially the muscles being in a spasm state, um, they, they, they cause what feels like tooth pain because these muscles refer pain to the teeth. So these people have been to their dentist, then an oral surgeon, then a root canal specialist. Some of them have had multiple root canals or teeth extracted and the pain doesn't go away. So then what, Mm -hmm. you know, and so eventually they find their way to me, whether it be through a dentist, a root canal specialist, an oral surgeon, a chiropractor, a physical therapist, acupuncturist. So the great thing about my mentor, Dr. Arthur Parker, is that he really embraced holistic treatment. Mm -hmm. So he had a really great and strong relationship with a lot of the naturopaths, chiropractors, acupuncturists in the area. Our referral pool is quite large because it's not only the dentists referring to us. It's it's other people that are treating uh, whole body as well. Like, are there other people like that do what you do? People around the world, people who might think that they have this issue and want to get um, evaluated, want to get some treatment possibly, like who do they go to? Like, what what would you say is the best thing for them to do? That's a good question that I wish I had a good answer for because I was trained in this specific modality by my mentor. So I don't necessarily know a ton of people that do it the same way. I know maybe one person um, near Chicago that does things pretty similarly. Um, And he's a dentist, but he's also been trained as I have been in craniosacral therapy, myofascial release. He does a very specific jaw manipulation. So these um, things, you know, that, that we do, these modalities are very are not taught in dental school. And so many dentists will say on their website or, or they'll say it out loud that they treat TMJ issues, but, but how they're treating it, I don't know. So I'm almost afraid to make referrals sometimes because I don't want anything getting worse. So there's no like database or directory for, for this. And I wish there was, but there's so much that's learned by uh, working with a mentor or um, the doctor I know in Chicago is he has like every letter in the alphabet after his name. He's just done, he's just so educated and he's so good at what he does, but that's really hard to find. Mm. So um, there's other people that are part of like certain study clubs or follow a certain philosophy of treatment that I would think could could help. Mm. But if, if you're looking for someone, a practitioner who makes an appliance that puts the muscles in their relaxed position, an appliance that fits in the mouth, who does myofascial release, craniosacral therapy, and jaw manipulation, that all of that is really hard to find. Mm. I can find one, (laughs) people that make the appliances, but I can't find all of them. So I'm not saying I'm the only one that does it, but I'm one of the only ones I know that does it this way, where it's so comprehensive. What I'd like to do in the future, my goal, long-term goal, is to maybe set up trainings with like a dentist that brings a local TMJ physical therapist to these trainings, because a lot of dentists are not interested in doing the myofascial, the muscle releases. They're not interested in doing the jaw manipulation or the craniosacral work, but maybe someone close by to them is, and then the patient can benefit by seeing both of those practitioners. Mm -hmm. So that's sort of long-term. I feel like I didn't answer your question well, but I don't. I mean, yeah, I think there isn't really an answer. I think that's the the reality of it. And I I was actually, when I thought of that question earlier, I was like, I'm excited to hear her answer. I don't know if you have an answer to this either, but I'm just going to put it out there. How many people do you think in the population demographically, like are dealing with the slightly milder versions of this and more dysfunctional versions of this? Yeah, I would say like probably 70% of people just have something mild going on that they've learned Mm -hmm. to live with and that they ignore. And like, I was even in that population when I started working with my mentor, I didn't even realize that I have like a dull jaw pain all the time. It was like a two out of 10, something I could live with. I avoided chewing gum, eating raw carrots. I could live with it. It was fine. But once he treated me, it's like way better. (laughs) I'm like, oh, it's nice to have a zero out of 10 pain, right? Yeah. So I would say a lot of people will sort of modify what they eat, how they hold their jaw, Mm -hmm. et cetera, without even being aware of it. Wow. Um, 
So to yeah. have something that's this prevalent, and obviously a section of those are going to be worse cases, and to not really have a go-to person or even team, I mean, to me, I think there needs to be more of a, either a training or just a, we need to have an, a, an approach for this right. in the medical community and, and the therapeutic kind of space. I, I mean, I know for myself, I, I've had patients or not patients, clients, I guess. I Sometimes I call them patients because <laughs> <laughs> they usually have things uh, medically going on. And I'll often be like, please talk to this doctor or you need to like talk to a doctor about deviated septum or this or that and you know i guess it's a, a space to watch whatever your long-term ideas are i like we need that i think i think yeah. we really really need that so you know i think it's great what you're doing by disseminating and talking about this stuff on social media it's just to really thank you <laughs> bring light to this because it's such an important issue. So back to TM, TMJ or TMJD, how do you want to, you're the expert, so what should we call it? I just always call it TMJD because I just okay. feel like that encompasses everything, like everything. the muscles and the joints and yeah. Okay. Okay. So for TMJD, what kind of symptoms should people be paying attention to like in the earlier phases? So anyone listening to this, if they've got some clicking, what's a red flag? So if you've always had clicking, which I always have too, so it was something I ignored and I lived with, and that's fine sometimes. If you notice that clicking gets more frequent or painful, or if your jaw starts catching or locking, mm -hmm. mm -mm. not great. <laughs> and so catching or locking is, so locking, I, I'm guessing it's like when it's stuck in one position, right? And yes. then ca catching, what is catching? Well, people kind of describe it differently. So they'll say like, it got stuck for like a second. So they don't consider mm -hmm. that locking. I mean, technically it is. <laughs> you know, they'll call it something different. Whereas if it's locked closed, which means you can still open when you, when I say locked closed. So just to clarify that, but you can only open maybe one or two finger widths, definitely not your whole range of motion. Sometimes people will wake up and they're kind of stuck that way for two or three hours. They'll always call that locking because it's not catching for some reason implies fleeting. <laughs> Okay. It's really quick. Yeah, I don't know why, but I'm just using the terminology I hear a lot. So that's kind of how I'm using it, just to clarify that. So what are some of the other conditions or other habits? What things do you see that are linked to this? Some of the other things I see that are very, very common are headaches and waking up with those headaches or them coming on throughout the day. People will say, well, it's always been like that. Well, it's not normal or okay to always have headaches. Like everybody deserves a pain-free life. And so to look into that and get that treated, and a lot of people will be clenching all day long like this, especially us women. I just see it all the time. And clenching all day is a habit that you can break. Mm -hmm. So, you know, working on breaking that, I have a YouTube video called How to Stop Clenching and Bruxing. Check that out. It's a really simple method to stop yourself from doing it all day. It's kind of annoying, but it, it works. And so I've, I've trained people to stop clenching during the day. I don't have a solution for nighttime clenching, but even limiting or stopping that daytime clenching can go a long way in terms of jaw pain and headaches and, and neck pain because you're recruiting a lot of muscles to clench hard. That's something I see a lot that patients of mine are doing. Wow. Yeah. I hear about that a lot on TikTok, a lot of comments, a lot of, there's a lot of traffic about that for sure. Yes. Some of the linked things that I wanted to ask you about were things like mouth breathing, maybe like a history of braces or teeth removal, airway issues, sleep apnea. These are the, some of the things that I see, you know, with my clients, as well as I've, I've read about, you know, when it comes to like jaw health. Do you see that stuff too? I, I was listening to some of your stuff, like about the scans you do, and maybe we can get into like the diagnostics. Like how do you diagnose this? I use a CBCT scan. So that's 3D imaging that shows us bony components of the jaw joints, some of the soft tissue, it does not show us the disc within the jaw joint. So a lot of people ask me that, and I just want to clarify, it doesn't show that disc, but definitely, I mean, tongue posture, mouth breathing, uh, sleep apnea, sleep disordered breathing, all of that I see a lot. And again, I have a YouTube video called tongue tie airway and TMJ disorder. So check that out. But just to briefly outline it, um, a tongue tie is something that sort of I almost feel like it's trending. Like everyone's talking about, do you have a tongue tie or does your kid have a tongue tie? And some people think it's just a fad that will pass. Other people are huge advocates of making sure that, um, you know, the tongue tie is treated, et cetera. What I see a lot is my patients have a tongue tie, which means when I say tongue tie, there's a little band of tissue that we all have underneath our tongues. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Called the frenum. 
And we all have that. So that doesn't mean we all have a tongue tie. But if that is too tight and restrictive and restricts the motion of our tongue, then that's considered a tongue tie. Some people have it so tight that they can't attain proper tongue posture. Proper tongue posture is having the entire tongue, the tip, the middle, and the back up against the roof of our mouths with a light suction. So some people that may be watching this are, are sitting and watching with their lips closed, hopefully, um, but their tongue is low in their mouth. That is not proper tongue posture. So when the tongue is sitting low in our mouth, what happens is it almost encourages mouth breathing and then throw in allergies or any stuffy nose or a deviated septum or enlarged nasal turbinates, which make nose breathing really difficult. A lot of these people with the low tongue posture will start breathing through their mouth. And to get enough oxygen in our bodies, we have to take like gulps of air rather than the streamlined nose breathing. So I, the way I try to think of it is like a hose spraying water without like a nozzle. It's just kind of spraying water everywhere. That's sort of like mouth breathing. And you have to just keep catching what you can to kind of get enough oxygen. Whereas if you put a nozzle on it, everything's really streamlined and that's sort of nose breathing. So a lot of my patients have this low tongue posture, they're mouth breathers, they've sort of developed a certain way. And because of that, the muscles start to compensate, the joints are not in a happy position. And so it's really involved and I'm trying to explain it as best as I can, but it's quite technical. Uh, so that can lead to, you know, the muscles getting trapped in a dysfunctional state too. It can, it can, be a factor that plays into all of this. And so many of my patients have sleep disordered breathing. They are mouth breathers. There's there's a lot going on. Forward head posture. I forgot that one for a second. Posture. Forward head posture. Yeah. And, and mouth breathers develop that forward head posture because it helps to open the airway. Yeah. And so that forward head posture puts too much strain on the neck, which feeds up and affects the jaw. So it's all related. There's just this correlation that I see with many, many of my patients. And so I recently had a patient who is just textbook, all of this, you know? And so she was, she's what, 19 or 20. She's very young, but she was so interested in learning. Like, why, why did my jaw lock? I'm like, I'm, I'm 19. I shouldn't have these issues. What's going on? So we went through, we found out that her adenoids were huge. Her tonsils were huge. She, her nose was completely blocked. She was definitely mouth breathing. And even then the tonsils were getting in the way of her getting good oxygenation. So through her treatment with me over six months time, we got the jaw unlocked to where she has a healthy range of motion, no clicking or popping, no pain. And in that time she got surgery for her deviated septum, for her enlarged turbinates, for her tonsils and her, and her adenoids. And she can breathe through her nose. You know, you can just see that she looks healthier. She doesn't have circles under her eyes anymore. She just, she's healthier. She actually wrote me a note recently. It was so gratifying, but she said that I changed her life and she now wants to become a pediatric ear, nose, and throat doctor so that she can find these issues young, even younger than she is. So she wants to be finding these issues at five, six, seven, when we can impact the oral facial development quickly to yeah. promote growth, forward growth, so that these mm. airway issues don't develop later in life. And so that was really gratifying. She just kind of got it and she wanted to know everything. She wanted to know the underlying cause. A lot of my patients don't. They, wow. they don't, they're just like, I, I'm in so much pain, just fix the problem. And I'm out of here. And so, you know, I'll definitely talk to them about what I find and encourage them to consult with a sleep doctor who would encourage them to get a sleep study if they think that's appropriate, et cetera. I'll do my best, but she was one of the ones that really took to it and wanted to know everything. Hmm. I don't know if this is slightly inappropriate, but do you get younger people coming in a mix? Do you get older people? It's not inappropriate. Um, yeah. A lot of my patients are females, first off. Okay. Um, this affects females a lot more than males because, of, because hormones play a huge component in TMJD. And um, specific hormones being relaxin and beta estradiol, which us women have in much higher levels. So a lot of my patients are women. And I see all ranges. I've seen little girls as young as nine whose jaws are locking closed. And then I've seen people in their eighties that are locked. So I see a range of women, I would say. Wow. And so going backtracking a little bit. So the cause, so hopefully people listening are interested in that. I certainly am. Cause I mm. want to ask you about that. Like, I guess a couple of parts of this, is there published literature on the causes? And like, is there kind of a consensus? And if there is, what is it? Um, and barring that, what do you think? Yeah, what are your comments on that? Yeah, I mean, I haven't come across any uh, literature about this, but um, 
it's very, very difficult because there's so many factors that can contribute to the cause. So um, for example, I had a patient who broke her tailbone in a really bad accident and she was in the hospital for a long time. And then um, about a month after she broke her tailbone, her jaw locked closed and she had never had jaw issues. So there is a connection between the hips and the jaw. There just is. I mean, there's so many pelvic floor physical therapists that see that and they treat jaw and pelvic floor or hips. Or I see patients that have had multiple whiplashes and then they have jaw issues, but they're also mouth breathers. So the, the muscles were probably compensating for a long time. But how do you prove that? <laughs> so that I think that's why there's no literature. It's just yeah, really yeah. difficult because there's like so many different factors that can contribute. Mm -hmm. And say you come in to see me and you have two of those factors, but someone else only has one and someone else has seven of those, those factors, right? Like I, it's really hard to get research on this. So mm -hmm. I, I haven't come across any great research, but what I see contributing a lot of the time is kind of what I mentioned, like um, postural discrepancies along the postural chain, sleep disordered breathing is a big one. And so just to sort of draw a direct line, if you have sleep apnea and you're struggling for oxygen every single night. What's happening is our body never gets to the deep levels of sleep. We're sort of stuck in fight or flight. So that's a very stressful mode for our body to be in. So as humans, as for whatever reason, when we're stressed, we're inclined to sink our teeth into whatever's stressing us out. And that is a physical act of clenching, clenching and grinding. So grinding the jaw forward will actually open the airway, similar to the chin tilt in CPR. So that's our brain's way of knowing, hey, if I grind the jaw forward, I can open the airway and get more oxygen. That clenching and grinding becomes a habit night after night after night. And eventually something's going to give in the joints or the muscles. Sleep apnea leads to clenching and grinding leads to TMJ issues. And that's when people come to see me. And some of them may know they have sleep apnea or some of them have no idea about the rest of this and how they got here. You know, that's where I, we, I come in and have a conversation with them. And so recently I had a patient who, I took a CBCT scan on that 3D imaging, and we take that with the patient standing up and standing up our airway, our nasopharyngeal airway, which is like a tunnel of airspace behind our noses and our mouths. When we're standing up, that should be nice and wide. And whenever we lie down, gravity pulls the weight of our jaw into that airway along with the tongue. So that becomes a little smaller. That space is taken up by the tongue more. Um, so we see that constricted a little bit when we lie down, but if I see that super constricted when they're even standing up and they've indicated on a sleep apnea questionnaire that I have that, you know, they wake up gasping for air. They wake up multiple times at night. They never feel rested. They wake up with headaches. You know, I kind of put two and two together and I say, Hey, would you be open to maybe consulting with a sleep doctor? And they may recommend a sleep study for you because that may be an underlying cause of what got you here. And most of them are open to it. And just recently, one of my patients, she's a young woman who does not fit the mold for sleep apnea. She's not overweight. She doesn't have a huge neck. She was diagnosed with severe sleep apnea, severe obstructive sleep apnea. And she's getting a CPAP for that. And she's getting her jaw pain and clicking and popping taken care of with me. I'm, I gave you a long answer to that, but okay. <laughs> that's what I see a lot. Yes. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. In terms of like the causes, I read this book called Jaws. Have you, have you heard of this book? Have, I've heard of it. I haven't read it yet. I need to read that. The story of a hidden epidemic, Sandra Kahn and Paul Ehrlich, Ehrlich something. Um, really, really good book. I need to read that. It's yes, I couldn't put it down. I'm very, um, I'm not very good with book reading. <laughs> so the fact that I was like glued to this is, is a good sign for the book. It's it takes very much like kind of more of an anthropological look at human beings and um, yes. some of the history. And, you know, a lot of it, it's, again, we, we don't have like solid proof of anything necessarily, but we, I think we're starting like, especially, you know, it goes into this with this book, starting to understand some of the social causes or like patterns that are happening for people. Uh, one thing that Dr. Mew talks about in some of his interviews that he's had is a lot of us, you know, we will go to daycare, we'll get sick, like as babies, you know, we'll go to daycare, we'll get sick. And then we're just perpetually kind of getting whatever flu or sickness is going around in a daycare. 
and we just become mouth breathers mm -hmm. over time having blocked noses so like he'll, dr b will talk a lot about like babies and blocked noses and i think there's just some interesting some theories as to like what what's happening why why are we why is this so rampant like why is this such an issue um let's get into a little bit of the treatments and like how how do you treat this you know what is how do you know what's treated like what what is a healthy tmj yeah so um we treat uh with orthotics so an orthotic is a, a appliance that you wear in your mouth and it's very different from a dental night guard. So a dental night guard is great at protecting the teeth from the forces of clenching and grinding, but it does not treat the muscles and the joints. So that's kind of where we come in. We measure where the muscles are the most relaxed and we make an appliance that actually holds the jaw in that position. It's a true orthotic, kind of like you wear one in your shoe mm -hmm. for hip alignment. You wear this on top of your teeth for jaw alignment. Wow. So it actually changes, yeah, where, where your jaw is being held while you're wearing it. And if the muscles are held in their relaxed position for a significant amount of time, they finally get a chance to snap out of that pain and spasm cycle. So that's how the orthotics work. But in addition to that, so I always make a daytime one and a nighttime one for all of my patients, for pretty much all of my patients um, with the goal of tapering off the daytime one, usually within 12 to 16 weeks. Mm -hmm. Once people start to feel better, I say, let's discontinue this or taper off of it. We don't want anyone dependent on wearing something in their mouths during the day. And people don't generally want that. Mm -hmm. So if there's a light at the end of the tunnel, like, hey, if you commit to it now, you get to take it out in a while. People are usually uh, committed to wearing it for that amount of time. In addition to that, we do myofascial release, which is a technique where we apply sustained pressure to really tight and constricted muscles and fascia. And what that sustained pressure does is it doesn't feel good while we're doing it, but what it does is it brings fresh blood flow and fresh oxygen to that area. And it promotes lymphatic flow and drainage of toxins, lactic acid that build up in those tight constricted muscles. It gives a, the fascia a chance to loosen up. So we do that at our appointments. And I usually see my patients every two weeks and I do the myofascial release I do craniosacral therapy, and I also do jaw manipulation as needed. And this jaw manipulation is an osteopathic technique that was taught to me by my mentor. And it's one that he developed after many years of studying all of this. So it's very technique sensitive. Um, it's, it's hard for me to show it, but we do all of that. And then a very important part of these appointments is we check the orthotics because they cannot change, but we, each patient can. So as the muscles get out of that pain and spasm cycle, as the clicking noises go down, as the jaw begins to unlock, we have to be adjusting the orthotics to keep up with the body's changes. So it's not just handing an, you an orthotic and saying, bye, see you later. Yeah. We're following through. And most of our patients are in treatment anywhere from three to six months, um, wow. seeing us every couple of weeks. Wow. Wow. That's so cool. And so this orthotic, so like, is it, um, does it go between the teeth or how does it? I'm just curious. Yeah. But yeah. Most of the ones I make fit on the bottom arch. So they cover all the bottom teeth. It covers all the bottom teeth. And then it has indentations in it that are specific to the patient's upper cusps. Mm -hmm. So it guides the upper cusps where to rest, putting the jaw in a very specific position. Mm -hmm. So it's like, it's not a huge mouthful. It doesn't fit on the top and the bottom. It's a bottom appliance. And it looks really similar to a dental night guard. So that's kind of the tricky part. But understanding that there's a very specific prescription built into that, guiding the upper teeth where to rest. And the way we find that prescription, we use um, a TENS unit and some very specific jaw tracking technology that's precise down to tenths of a millimeter. Wow. So we're using, yeah, the firing of the muscles where, yeah, we're doing things um, in, it's, it's called neuromuscular dentistry. So there, there is um, a number of dentists that are using that method as well. And so we're definitely using that software, that method of treatment. And then, of course, we sort of tweak all of those per patient because everybody's unique. Yeah. Wow. That's amazing. That's so interesting. Oh, so like you're kind, you're trying to find this, this kind of bespoke position and uh, confirmation or orientation for that person, you know, like what's ideal for them. Um, wow. That's yeah, that's really, really cool. What's what is like the number one, like misconception about this stuff that you want people to know about or that you you're trying to share yeah i mean i think what i hear a lot is that a night guard is the same as an orthotic and that's kind of really if you watch my tiktok that's what i'm trying to like 
<laughs> really kind of nail in to people's psyches is that they're very different. It's not the same. And I've seen dental night guards actually make things a lot worse. So I had, for example, I had a patient who came to see me. He um, was waking up with his jaw locked closed. He could barely open one or two finger widths. He was in a lot of pain. And then he was kind of able to maneuver it unlocked, which isn't always, po- which is rarely possible, but he could do it. And so he came to see me and I said, okay, we need to get on this before it locks and you can't maneuver it unlocked. Um, so I explained what an orthotic was and there must have been some misunderstanding because he went back to his dentist and he got a regular night guard made. And he wore it one night and he woke up the next day and his jaw was locked closed and he could not maneuver it unlocked. So now he comes back to me with a totally different condition because that's way harder to treat. (laughs) And so then we get him in orthotics. I got him unlocked. I got him out of pain. But, you know, he he was upset. He's like, well, I thought it was the same thing. And I said, it's not the same thing Mm -hmm. because what a night guard does is they're great at protecting the teeth from the forces of clenching and grinding. So I'm not bashing night guards by any means means, but an orthotic changes the relationship between the upper arch and the lower arch. It puts everything in a more favorable position for the muscles and the joints. A night guard does not do that. It keeps that relationship the same and gives more leverage to clench and grind against. So it often makes things worse. And so that's kind of the point I'm trying to just drive home Mm. is please don't get an over the counter night guard. If you have TMJ problems, don't get a dental night guard either because it can make it worse. Now, if you have no TMJ problems and you know you're clenching and grinding your teeth all night, get a dental night guard, get an over the counter one. It may just help you. But if you have TMJ issues, please don't do that. It can often make it worse. But like if people are, if they're knowingly clenching or grinding, is it possible for them to develop like TMJ problems? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I guess if you're clenching or grinding, that might be a clue that, you know, your airway is like, your bite and your airway are not in optimal place. Maybe, I don't know, see a myofunctional therapist or look into myofunctional, yeah. I don't know, like yeah. something, yeah, something on more like on a preventative. Because a lot yeah. of a lot of my audience, at least for now, <laughs> tend to be younger. Not yeah. that that will necessarily, I mean, people of all ages see you, I know that, but I think a lot of them are interested in, in how can, you know, um, how can they maybe keep it working well um, instead of developing a problem later on? So I guess, you know, if clenching or grinding is happening, then yeah, like wh- where's the line, would you say, for someone um, between night guard or orthotic? <laughs> yeah, it's hard. Yeah. Um, if you don't have any TMJ symptoms, if you don't have headaches, jaw pain, clicking, popping, episodes of the jaw locking, catching, mm-hmm. et cetera, you're probably going to be okay with a night guard. Yeah. And that's fine. And, um, but if you have those, there's a chance that the night guard can make those a lot worse. Mm -hmm. So really be careful in how you move forward with that. I mean, I guess I would say that's where the line is, is whether you have symptoms or whether you don't. Yeah. And night guards are provided by dentists. Yeah. So dentists will take uh, molds of your teeth, impressions or scans. There's like intraoral scanners, fancy now. Um, And so they get records of your teeth essentially. And then they send those to the lab and the lab will make the night guard and send it back and then it gets fitted. And so a lot of people think, well, I have a custom guard. Isn't that the same as an orthotic? And it's not. So, but yeah, they they can be really, really effective, you know, and, and they can help quite a bit. So I'm not Um, but it's just, if you have TMJ issues, I've also seen them make those worse. Yeah. And the type of orthotic that you, uh, make for people is, is that just your clinic, your practice? No, I think, um, it's, it's well known. It's called a Mora. So mandibular orthopedic repositioning appliance. I think that's what that stands for. Yeah. Mandibular orthopedic repositioning appliance, Mora. So it fits on all the lower teeth. Yeah. And it has indentations. It's just finding that prescription and figuring out where to put those indentations. Mm -hmm. That is, that's a skill because we use the software, but I modify what we find on the software based on each person's unique condition. I see. Yeah. So it's not, yeah, that's where the, that's where the kind of tricky part comes in. And sometimes I have to send it back. Like, you know what, we didn't get the prescription, right? We're going to do this. We're going to modify it this way. And then you know, so it's, it's, it's not easy work, yeah. um, but I love it. And so it does take skill. And that's, oh, yeah. and that's another big difference between a night guard and a, an orthotic. I'm not saying a night guard doesn't take skill, but um, there, it, it, there's no prescription built into it. 
So it doesn't take that particular skill to make it. And I think that's where people say, well, an orthotic costs way more, a night guard costs way less. I'm going to go this way. But like, what price do you put on your pain? Mm -hmm. Right. And how much is it affecting the quality of your life? And so a lot of TMJ dentists, myself included, we try to make this as affordable as we can for our patients. And we offer like a down payment and then monthly payments interest free till it's paid off. Mm -hmm. So it's not like, it's all up front. And then we just can do the orthotics and buy, like we follow our patients through the treatment. And so that's another thing I'm coming across too, is it's just way too expensive. Insurance doesn't cover it. It's just, I would never do that. And it's just so unfortunate because um, I feel like it, it can just be so life-changing. Mm-hmm. It can be so life-changing for so many people. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. And yeah, the craniosacral therapy and the myofascial therapy, did you learn that from uh, Parker as well? Or you said- Yeah, I learned it from my mentor, but I also took some courses in craniosacral therapy as well. Um, He really wanted me to go to the courses, which I I, I was totally all for to really understand, of course, everything behind it. (laughs) Because he could, he, he was a man, he is a man of few words. (laughs) So, (laughs) you know, he would show me things and, and, but I like to understand everything. So going to a course and getting the literature and getting the books and, Mm. you know, I delved deep into that. And so I did both. I learned from him and I, I went to courses. And what is the craniosacral therapy? Like, what does that address? How is that related to it? Yeah, that addresses the fascia. And so many of us have really tight and constricted fascia, especially the people that come to see me. Mm -hmm. Um, Can you just quickly define fascia? Just just, Yeah, yeah, yeah. sorry. It's okay. uh, (laughs) It's it's the connective tissue that surrounds and supports our muscles and our organs. So there is a line of fascia that goes from our heads all the way through our bodies. That's all connected. So that's kind of neat. And there's a really great TED talk by this woman who talks all about fascial work. And I don't know what her name is. I can find it or I can, you know, send it to you later after this. But she's like wearing this bodysuit to like show what fascia is. And I just love it because she explains it so well. I may um, have seen than... that. I think yeah. I may have seen that. We'll, we'll link it below. Yeah. Um, we'll definitely link that. It's treating that fascia in a very gentle but effective manner. Mm-hmm. And so I have a craniosacral therapist on board as well, like another one. Mm-hmm. And she's a dental hygienist and craniosacral therapist and licensed massage therapist. Wow. So she's awesome. Yeah. She, yeah. she understands all of it, right? Like the dental part of it, the, how the orthotics should fit, how they need to be adjusted and the craniosacral work. And so if we can loosen up a lot of these muscles and the fascia that surrounds them, we increase the range of motion. We see the muscles calm down. So it, I think it's a really important part of everything. One of the questions I was getting from my followers was, is it curable? Yeah. <laughs> so what do you, yeah, what would you say to that? Um, yeah. you know, what's what's yeah. a healthy TMJ? Having a good range of motion, that's being able to put about three fingers in the mouth. Um, no clicking and popping is ideal. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I don't, if you have clicking and popping and you have no pain, it's not progressing. I don't want you to rush out and try to get treatment. That's not what I'm trying to say. Many of us can live with clicking and popping for our entire lives without it progressing. Um, however, if you do want to get treatment, that is not ideal to have clicking and popping and it can be treated. Um, so, so having no joint noises, having a good range of motion, having no headaches, jaw pain, neck pain, ear pain, stuffy ears. I mean, having that good quality of life, you can yawn without pain. You can bite into a sandwich without pain. You can chew tougher food, steak, salad, raw carrots, et cetera, without it hurting. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, for like a lot of the stuff that I'm working with people on, I'll, I'll talk a lot about the tongue, like tongue posture is yeah. one of the main things that I talk to people about because it, it seems to relate to most people's concerns, like from a aesthetic or just from like a face yoga kind of point of view. Yeah. Oh yeah, how do I, you know, how do I have this, more of this or more of that, da, da, da. And I'm like, we can do these little things but long term like we need to we need to work on the tongue posture and and um and like the tongue posture i think is so related to the jaw um you know i mean how would you say that the tongue and the jaw how would you describe their relationship to each other oh, yeah i mean very intimate <laughs> so, <laughs> basically if the tongue is in the right position from birth onwards which is up against the roof of the mouth It affects the development of your upper arch, your upper jaw, your maxillary bone. And if 
the tongue is up where it's supposed to be exerting pressure up and sideways, that upper arch will grow wide enough to accommodate all of our teeth. And the lower jaw, the, the actual jaw, the mandible will follow. And that's huge because if everything is growing to accommodate all of the teeth, you yeah. have the forward growth, the wide growth, then you're going to have a good airway too. So it's like, I can walk around and look at people and look at their orofacial development and tell you pretty much whether they're mouth breathers or nose breathers right away, just because I see it all the time. You can't unsee it. It's you can't unsee it. You can't unsee it. Like you just can't. And so, so um, well, actually, let's get into that a little bit, just because this is a face yoga related topic for us right now. What are the things that you that make you be able to see that? Like, what 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 are the characteristic things? That you... Yeah, having um, kind of an equal distance he, distance here to here to here, it, or having like a wider face than a longer face. It, it, that wider face tells us that these these arches are developed as they should be. Mm -hmm. So you're kind of the poster child of a nasal breather, of a nose breather, which is good, <laughs> right? And um, there's, if you even just Google like nose breather versus mouth breather, mm -hmm. you can see it. And so having a good lip seal, like while you're watching me right now, your lips are together. You have that equal distance. You have that width here. Mm -hmm. But mouth breathers will often have their mouths open. They don't have a lip seal. Mm -hmm. And because they have a mouth open, their mouth open, and they often have forward head posture to get an adequate airway, all of this starts to develop that way. Everything just goes grows longer from here onwards. So people that have a really long lower face and their mouths are open, they're mouth breathers, period. I mean, yeah. you can't breathe through your mouth if your lips are sealed, right? Yeah. And so, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's really, really easy to see. And so oftentimes too, when you're breathing through your mouth and your tongue is low, this upper arch does not develop. It does not become wide and flat it becomes narrow and very arched. Mm -hmm. And if it's arched, it starts putting pressure on your nasal septum and that'll start to cave and get deviated. And so, I mean, and you, I mean, there's a lot, there's so much that goes into this. I feel like, yeah, no, I, I know, but I, I, it's good to hear your perspective, like as a medical, you know, person, like you're a doctor, you know, I'm not just making it up, you guys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, one way that I've heard it described, and I don't remember if it was this book or where I heard it, but thinking about like the nose, like what's the best way to get a lot of air in is to have, you know, holes like tubes. And like, so if we're breathing through the mouth and the mouth starts be be becoming more like a, a tube, mm -hmm. you know, and so that just lengthens everything. Yes. Yes. Um, and uh, I also, I've heard this, I think it was in an interview, maybe of Mew or something, but um, that we, sh we should breathe through our mouth as much as we eat through our nose. Yes, <laughs> never. <laughs> I know, that, that was just like, wow, you know, I've been practicing like a conventional yoga for the body and so on for many years. And nose breathing is such a like staple, like it's, you know, one of the main physical sports or activities that just harp on about breathing. Every breath is planned and it's usually through the nose. Um, so I think, you know, that's probably helped me. One thing that I've noticed is people that I work with who are yoga practitioners or who used to practice yoga, they tend to really take very easily to a lot of the stuff that I, I teach. Um, it's usually quite quick and easy. Um, so yeah, there's definitely a component to like, you know, the nose breathing versus the mouth breathing. So you yeah, know, it's huge. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's how a lot of people get here. It starts young. Yeah. you know, and then eventually the muscles can only compensate for so long, the joints can only take so much of that clenching and grinding activity. And then they end up in my office. There are some people who I've spoken to about getting a sleep doctor talking about their tongue position, and they're just not interested. They're like, No, like you got me better. I'm out. So yeah, <laughs> okay. I can only do so much I can tell you everything that I see and then other people want to do everything. So it's kind of it's yeah. kind of interesting for those people it maybe it will come back. Maybe it won't but maybe it won't. Yeah. yeah, having the tongue up lip sealed all of that. It's not like when when the structures around here and the fashion everything kind of has to be in the right sort of place in the right condition for it to happen in a comfortable way. Mm -hmm. But if that if that's happening, then that's happening. Like I'll, I'll post something about mewing and some people will be like, I already do all of this. Like, what, what are you, you know, this is normal. Yeah. Like, so, and that's yeah. fine. That's good. Like, you don't have to like, <laughs> worry. Yeah, you don't it. have to change anything. Yeah. Where other people are like, what, where is your tongue supposed mm. to be? Mine's not there, you know? Yeah. And they're just blown away because we all have our normal. One thing I really want to emphasize too, is if you have a really restrictive tongue tie, you can't get your tongue up to the roof of your mouth. 
without pain or without straining a lot of other muscles. So if you are going to try to attempt that, seeing uh, someone that provides myofunctional therapy, which is a physical therapy for the muscles of the head, neck and jaw, but specifically the muscles that surround and support the tongue is like vital Mm -hmm. because I (laughs) am trained in providing myofunctional therapy. But what I did was I thought, you know, I had two patients whose jaws were locked closed. They were in a ton of pain. And I noticed their low tongue posture and I thought, I'll fix everything. I'll fix the jaw. I'll get the tongue posture right. I'll correct everything. And this patient's going to be feeling so great. So I tried to incorporate the myofunctional therapy at the same time that I was treating the TMJD and they got worse Hmm. because it was too much because the TMJD, I'm putting the muscles in their most relaxed position and asking them to baby the jaw. And the myofunctional therapy is like intense exercise for those same muscles. So, uh, you know, it seems so obvious when I say it now, but it's not that obvious when you're just like trying to do it. And so um, it didn't work. And so I had to drop that part out and make that like a phase two of their treatment. So that's interesting. And and so I think teasing that apart a little bit, like I've noticed that when I'm working with people with TMJ, TMJD, we pretty much just do massage and relaxation and posture work, like like neck posture work and neck releases and massage. Like we almost do, we do practically no exercises. You do like eye exercises and stuff, sometimes a little bit of cheek, but very little like jaw. I mean, I don't really do, I basically just encourage people to just try to chew, you know, using their jaw. Mm-hmm. For as a jaw exercise, it's you know we don't really right. need to do much more than that. But yeah, I mean usually it's just tension release. That's the main thing that I've noticed tend to benefit from. So and even yeah. like the tongue posture work that that I'll I'll do, it's very limited if yeah. at all. You know. Um, yeah. So yeah, I mean that has been some of my experience. I've learned that a little bit by like through through doing it, you know, right. and yeah. people will be like, I can't do that, or it doesn't like fit or whatever. And I'm like, okay, let's just forget that. For yeah. now. <laughs> like, yeah. we'll, we'll, we'll like come to that later. But, um, but yeah, that's really interesting. That's good to, to know that the myofunctional therapy is you can't do them at the same time, really, you need to work on the jaw first. Yeah, you really shouldn't. I was just I tried it, and it made things yeah. worse. And I felt awful. <laughs> Does this stuff come back? I guess yeah. if the right treatment, it, it doesn't, but yeah. Um, it, it can. And so a lot of our patients, when I release them from active treatment, I release them knowing and, and giving them instructions to wear the nighttime orthotic mm-hmm. indefinitely, mm-hmm. because that seven or eight consecutive hours of putting the muscles in their happy place will make them be able to you know, function and have healthy function through that next day. And then they repeat it again. Mm-hmm. So seven or eight hours. But what I've seen is that if the patient's dog gets to the appliance and chews it up, which does happen, or they lose it or they break it, you know, a clenching and grinding, we can't stop you from clenching and grinding. So some people will crack their appliances from all that force after an amount of time. Mm-hmm. Some people will be able to wean themselves off of it or they just don't need it anymore. And other people, their symptoms will start coming back quickly. Mm-hmm. So they need that night. They become dependent on the nighttime appliance. And then other people, I released a patient from treatment and he was doing great. And then he had a pretty bad car accident where he got whiplash and now his joint is clicking and popping. So it's like he just suffered another injury and he's coming back for treatment. Mm -hmm. So it it really depends. It depends on so many different factors, all the factors that can cause it. I mean, I like to release my patients knowing that they're doing well and that they're functional, but it's hard to say what's going to happen in their futures Mm -hmm. or if I'll be seeing them again. And so... Yeah, that's typically what I see. What, one person that I worked with, that person ended up getting orthodontics, <gasps> so like braces, and then was going on to like double jaw surgery and, and things like that. So yeah. why do, would people need that? Do people need that? Like, what, what's your opinion on, on that type of treatment course? Yeah, well, I always like to think of surgery as a last resort because I would want that to be my last resort. And so that's what, how most of my patients feel as well. But sometimes it's just unavoidable. And so um, we have like a 90% success rate. And when we cannot get a jaw unlocked, when we cannot, when, when we just kind of plateau, you know, our referral is an oral surgeon and let's see what they say. Let's see what they can do for you. Um, now to have like a complete, like your whole jaw replaced, like that sort of surgery is pretty rare to have to need that. But I have, I do know someone that's needed that. She wasn't a patient of mine. She's actually um, somewhat an acquaintance from junior high. And she kind of contacted me and I talked to her through the whole thing, but she had a condition called idiopathic condylar resorption. So it's a fancy way of saying idiopathic means you don't know what's causing it. 
Condyle is the bony knob that our jawbone ends on. And resorption is means your body's sort of eating itself for whatever reason. Yeah. It's destroying that area. So her condyle was was just kind of becoming resorbed, I think, on both sides. Mm. What happens then is, you know, the jawbone holds houses all of these lower teeth. So if it starts deteriorating up here, your jaws, your bite's going to feel totally different all the time because literally this, this jawbone is deteriorating. And so she got her whole jaw replaced. She had that done and she's doing really well. I've kind of like seen her pictures before, right post-op surgery. And I think it's been a couple of years now and she's doing great. I mean, her bite isn't changing all the time. So she got that surgery. She got braces again. Seems like she's doing really well. So for some people, but it's pretty rare, but for some yeah. people that is the route. One of the surgeries that I was thinking about, and I'm not an expert in this, so I don't know if this is definitely a thing, but like where they'll like cut parts of the jaw to like make them align better. Yeah. Yeah. Those are called Lafort surgeries. Okay. Yeah. yeah Lafort one, Lafort two. Um, so you can Google that and look it up if you're interested. But those surgeries, I knew someone that had one done. Those can be helpful too, because a lot of the time they can pull like the maxilla forward or the mandible forward, and that can help open the airway. Mm -hmm. So these Lafort surgeries can be life changing for some people. I mean, um, a lot of people don't want to go that route, but some people do. And as a side note, it can be aesthetic reasons too. Like if you have these bones are just really set back in your face, you yeah. almost have this type of appearance, mm -hmm. you know, when your jaw isn't actually forward, but it's, this is so far regressed. And mm -hmm. some people don't like that. They're like, you know what? I want everything lined up. Mm -hmm. And so for aesthetic reasons and airway reasons, they may be getting those types of surgeries and I've seen them be successful. I definitely think that it's possible for people to influence that to a non-zero degree without surgery. I, I mean, it sounds like you do too, given what you're doing. I think one of my, like the people, person I was working with, I, I was pretty surprised at how kind of extreme the treatment plan was. I think methods like yours or what you've learned and what you're helping to give to people treatment wise, I think it's, it's really awesome stuff. Just fantastic. I'm really glad that. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, that you're doing it. I think we've covered quite a lot. Yeah. Yeah, we yeah. have. It's been great. Any last thoughts? Any kind of last uh comments i love your um tiktok i love the the face yoga that you do and i've tried some of the techniques on myself and it's oh, really cool. it's fun for me to watch yeah and it's like some things i'm looking at hey i should recommend that to this patient and oh yeah i love what you do oh thanks that's awesome where do you have like a website where can people learn more about your practice and yeah it's um www.tmjdentaldoc.com so awesome. that's my website <laughs> okay, great. Well, yeah, we'll definitely put all those links to your website, your TikTok, your YouTube, you. Instagram. Yeah, right. Instagram, I'm on all the things. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much for answering these questions. Yeah. And I'm sure a lot of people are, are definitely going to benefit from learning about this. I've learned a lot. I'm going to have to re-listen to this, I think, because <laughs> I just like integrate a lot of the stuff that I've learned. I've had so many questions on this for a while. So it's just so yeah. great to, to have someone who's an expert on this topic. Thank you so much, Priya. Oh, thank you for having me. This You're has been welcome. very fun. <laughs> yes, awesome. Thank you. Okay. Bye.